today um, I'm basically going to um, go through a couple of uh, uh, papers uh, that sort of point you in the direction where you might want to look about information related to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 that is relevant for policy making. So this is sort of looking more towards uh, what you might want to run uh, to, to uh, uh, look into as you think about your uh, project. Um, there are lots of questions we've discussed. Um, we've discussed, oh, if it, if it better, maybe if it's better if I hold the microphone here. Is this better? All right, great. I'll just, uh, I'll just do that. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's static off my sweater. I'm just going to hold it like this. Uh, thanks for letting me know. So we've discussed a lot of um, sort of low-level uh, aspects about the virus. It's genomic composition, it's molecular virology. Um, you know, we looked at sequencing diagnostics. We looked at, um, you know, vaccine design, immune response. But a lot of these things are secondary uh, to the way decisions are made about pandemic responses. You have to look at, uh, in some sense, much simpler metrics. Uh, but on the, other, uh, on the other hand, they're also quite consequential. And the things that we've uh, discussed uh, about vaccines and drugs and, and, and uh, you know, viral genomics and evolution are all, they all play into this, but they're almost at the secondary level. Uh, the level, uh, so the, the way you treat a response to the virus would first, and historically this is the way it happened uh, with COVID, uh, is based on um, sort of much broader, much more intuitive metrics. And the first question would be how deadly is the virus? This turns out to be a remarkably difficult uh, question to address uh, because we need to um, estimate uh, one of the things that is difficult to observe. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. How is the virus spreading? Uh, does it target different populations? And when it does target different populations, what does it do to them? Uh, you can also, uh, you also need to know when did the virus enter the population? Because obviously if it's endemic, you would have a very different response than uh, to what uh, you might do if it's uh, just entered the population. Once you've decided how bad of a problem it is, uh, the next set of questions is what can you do about it? Uh, so which interventions are available? Which interventions are practical? And what are the ethical implications? So we'll discuss um, sort of this broad set of questions today and next Thursday, uh, and we'll start with uh, the first couple of questions. Uh, so uh, here's you know what feels like ancient history at the beginning of March. Um, so there's this infamous tweet uh, by uh, the New York mayor, New York City mayor, Bill De Blasio. Uh, Notes the date, uh, March second. To some encouraging New Yorkers to go in with your lives and get out in the town despite coronavirus, I thought I would offer some suggestions. You know, go see a movie, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, juxtaposed with this is an article uh, from the New York Times that is dated uh, March the 1st, uh, which reports the first uh, confirmed case of coronavirus in New York City. Manhattan woman is first confirmed case in state. who traveled to Iran, contracted the virus, is now isolated at home. So, Obviously, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect between that because, you know, uh, if, if Bill de Blasio had a crystal ball or anybody did back then, other responses would have, recommendations would have been quite different. Uh, but, you know, let me ask you this question. Do you think it's an unreasonable, uh, uh, is it really something that, you know, he shouldn't have said? Uh, and one of the things you need to realize about epidemics and this usually happens uh, you know, for all of them, that by the time you realize that something's wrong, uh, it means the virus has been around for a little bit of time. Uh, and how long it's been around, it uh, you know, could, could, could differ based on the pathogen. So by the time you see the first case, uh, you can be pretty certain that there are many others that you're not aware of, especially in a city as large um, as New York City. Uh, and you know, the comment is that generally people switch from ambivalence to panic very fast. Yes, yes, indeed. And we'll discuss why that happened next time. Uh, and a lot of it was uh, sort of, uh, you know, more emotional in some sense than rational. And, and a lot of it was driven by lack of uh, reliable information. 
So um, let's look now, now with um, you know, a lot more data available to us, uh, we can look uh, at a much more systematic approach to evaluating when and where the virus actually got into, say, New York. And you could, I'm just using New York as an example. We're going to go through a few other studies and I'll show you sort of where to look. But here's a paper that, was, that appeared uh, this week, uh, just on Tuesday, uh, in Nature, even though, if you recall, there's publication delay. This paper was written uh, at the beginning of summer, submitted in July, and then took a while to um, you know, review. So because there's about what looks like three months uh, between reception and, and acceptance, it means there was at least one round uh, of review. And the title of this paper is Repeated Cross-Sectional um, Zero Monitoring of SARS-CoV-2 in New York City. And the goal of that uh, paper was basically, um, uh, it, there were several um, goals, which we'll, we'll see, um, were addressed. And because it involves uh, human subjects, and it's sort of a kind of a clinical trial kind of thing, except not really a trial, it's what's called a cross-sectional analysis. Uh, so the, the uh, to quote from the paper, they conducted a retrospective, repeated cross-sectional analysis of anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike antibodies. So retrospective means they've just looked at historical data. Cross-sectional means it's just basically a convenient sample that weren't targeting any particular cohort or group. Um, and then um, they were looking for um, anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike antibodies. If you think about what this means, is if you remember the course of the infection, uh, the first, there's, there are two types of tests that are routinely deployed. Uh, there's the RT-PCR test, which uh, checks for the presence of viral RNA. It is usually thought of as a test to detect active infection, um, even though there's some debate that would it, you know, if it's, if, if it's tuned to be too sensitive, it might um, actually uh, detect past infection, so you know, fragmented viral RNA. But basically, that's, that's looking for active infection. That's what you see you know, when people talk about cases. Uh, but an antibody analysis looks for people that had an infection uh, already. So their immune system had been stimulated to produce specific antibodies to uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike. This study was conducted over a period of uh, you know, February through July, um, so five months, weekly intervals. Um, and when they say cross-sectional, it means that it simply was, you know, whoever happened to be uh, in this cohort that they look uh, in this this group of patients that they looked at, so there are 10,000 plasma samples from patients in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Uh, the goal of this study was to uh, look at the dynamics of seroprevalence, and seroprevalence is a fancy word to just say you know what fraction of people have anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike antibodies, which is a proxy or you know it's an estimate of how many people in this group had a SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 infection. They looked at this population and split it into two arms uh, based on what kind of care the patients were after. Uh, so they had the urgent care group, so people that went to urgent care or went to uh, the emergency room. Uh, and uh, that was uh, enriched for COVID-19 cases during the epidemic, especially for severe cases. And then you had the routine care group, uh, which more closely resembles the general population. Uh, right. So I think I have, yeah, there we go. So before we go on uh, to look at the study some more, here's a timeline of what um, happened in New York City uh, over the period from February to July. And I'm sure you all remember this because it was all over the news and New York City was one of the hardest hit places in the United States. Uh, so here's the first case. You know, this is when Bill de Blasio made his tweet about going on the town. This is when they started uh, doing surveillance. Uh, here you see the number of cases is um, increasing very rapidly. Uh, it would have it was probably higher. Uh, it's simply at the time they didn't have um, testing capacity. They were only running on, on the order of hundreds to maybe a thousand PCR tests per day. And notice how quickly um, it, it, everything escalated. So you know, first case a week later there's a state of emergency. Uh, you know, two weeks later there's shelter in place. And the other, the other characteristic feature here is that you have cases followed by a lagged curve of deaths, because obviously it takes you know some time from infection to death, and those were the uh, uh, you know really um, 
uh, hard times in New York where you have hundreds of people dying uh, every day. Um, and then, you know, things decayed and were calm um, all the way over the summer. Uh, right, sorry, this is just a, uh, a replicated slide. Uh, in order to do, uh, you know, why would, why would you want to do this uh, type of analysis? Um, and there are many of them that have been done around the world. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a study just in a little bit that integrated all of them is in, in a neat way. Uh, fundamentally, it is an essential type of study to understand what was the true infection rate. So what fraction of the population was likely infected at any given time. Uh, and it is not the same fraction as um, people that present with severe disease because the true infection rate would include people with mild cases and people that are asymptomatic to the point that they don't seek care. So you don't know that they're infected unless you're deploying you know, nationwide testing strategies. Uh, you need to know how many people were infected in order to calculate the denominator uh, for the infection fatality rate. So you need to know the number of people that were infected. You can count how many died. That's pretty reliable. Uh, and the infection fatality rate is what you really need uh, for uh, decision making as opposed to case fatality rate. I mean, both of them are important, uh, but for a population country or state level, the infection fatality rate is more uh, important and more informative. Uh, so the use of CR surveys or antibody tests is a standard approach uh, to measure the rate of past infection uh, and not uh, the presence of active infection, which is designed by, uh, which is done through uh, QTP, uh, RT-PCR test. Uh, if you remember, we discussed this, I think, in lecture four. This is done by um, immunostaining or precipitation uh, enzyme-linked uh, assay, which basically looks for the presence of uh, specific antibodies that bind to viral uh, spike. Uh, the, uh, this group designed their own test. Uh, it's a two-stage test where they basically do a batched pre-screen where they pull a bunch of samples together, uh, pre-screen of the set uh, dilution for reactivity to receptor binding domain. And then if a sample, um, a batch is positive, then they perform uh, subsequent testing on positive batches uh, with a more sort of more detailed test where they look at not just uh, the receptor binding domain, but against the full length spike protein. And they also measure the antibody titer, which is you know how many how many specific antibodies there are. So it tells you not just about the presence uh, of infection, but also you know how uh, uh, stimulated the immune response was. They claim that two sequential assays reduce the false positive rates uh, and result in the sensitivity of ninety five percent and the specificity of one hundred percent. So you know whenever I see a number of one hundred percent, the statistician in me becomes very suspicious because there's no test that is always accurate, uh, but that, that's what this means. Remember, specificity means that uh, among, uh, you know, if you take it at face value, specificity of 100 means for every, every positive test result is an actual infection, and a sensitivity of 95% means that uh, among uh, 95 infections, or among 100 infections, it's going to find 95 and it's going to miss five. Uh, if, if you dig into their um, extended data, um, you know, here's what uh, their conclusions are drawn based on. Uh, so this was uh, they validated their test in the lab. Uh, in order to do this validation, they need to feed it um, some number of blood samples. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. And you do this two by two table. Again, we discussed it in some detail in the past, but it doesn't hurt to review. So in this case, um, that looked like there was um, 114 overall samples. Uh, there were 74 samples that had no COVID, and so negative controls and 40 positive controls. And if you look at this confusion table or two by two contingency table, you can see that among 40 positive cases, the test came back for positive 38 times and missed two. So this is how they get, uh, you know, two out of um, 40. Uh, so that's your. Uh, 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 specificity, sorry, that's your sensitivity, and your specificity is there were no false positives, right? So for uh, for the negative um, uh, for, for the negative samples, the test always came back as negative. Uh, now, because this is not a very large sample, it's only 114. Uh, you can uh, then say 
that even their, though their point estimates are very good, so 95% sensitivity and 1% specificity, because it's a small sample, there are large error bars on it. So then you can see that the 95% confidence interval, for example, and specificity goes all the way down to 95%, which doesn't seem like a lot. Uh, but if you know you go back and review the notes when we discussed it, if you do lots and lots of tests and most of the cases are negative, this could lead to um, a fairly poor positive predictive value. So in this case, it's uh, but it's still no worse than 90%. All right, so they have their own test, they did their own validation, um, and you know, what is it that they measured? They, uh, yes, in the week of February 9th, uh, you know, 2020, they started to collect residual, uh, random, de-identified cross-sectional plasma samples originally obtained for standard of care medical procedures, uh, which means that, you know, you come into the hospital for whatever it is that you need to do, uh, uh, you, you uh, give blood, you know, maybe for normal blood chemistry or some other reason, and that whatever's left over um, is used for this testing. So it's preserved, that it's randomized in the sense that um, you don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, select a particular subset of patients. You de-identify, it means you, can't, you cannot trace it to a specific person. Cross-sectionally means you do it across the entire population. Um, but this is sort of basically uh, like using um, a subset of people who came into the hospital to screen them. And they divided uh, all the subjects into two distinct groups. So you had emergency department or urgent care routine visits. You know, and that, that was a long list of what it is. It's, you know, if you had elective surgeries, visits not related to infectious disease, so OBGYN, OB cardiology, or so on. Uh, the mandatory table one for um, a, a study or a survey uh, where you can look at uh, the important characteristics of um, the study population. So you can look at the routine uh, care groups as this is brought it, broke it out into OBGYN. Uh, so visits and deliveries, oncology, uh, surgery, cardiology, and other office visits. Um, and then you, you can sort of start scanning it and you know see if the representation makes sense. Um, so you had, you know, um, the vast majority were female for OBGYN, uh, you know, about half and half for oncology, about half and half for surgery, about half and half for uh, cardiology and other visits. Uh, you can also see that age groups make, uh, you know, good sense. For instance, you don't expect a whole lot of young uh, people to look for uh, cardiology consults. So that's um, heavily, more heavily weighted towards um, older populations, but for, and you also don't expect there to be uh, as many in the OBGYN young group or old group, right? Because, you know, this is the peak utilization, 21 to 40. Um, and then you can just scan it and look at, uh, you know, the fraction of each subgroup um, that over all the visits, right, aggregated over all time. You can see that in OBGYN in New York, there were about 13.4% positives, you know, 9.3% in oncology and so on. So overall, about 11% of the population uh, were antibody positive. You know, and, and uh, a subset of those had um, COVID diagnostics. And if you look at the urgent category, uh, this is not broken down into any particular group. And again, you would you would expect uh, you know about an equal representation of men and women. You would expect some you know skew, and here it's quite significant towards um, the older uh, subgroup. And you see that the uh, antibody positivity here is more than twice as high, so 26 percent. Uh, and they give you um, sort of a representative slice, um, sort of representative statistics in all of New York to say that, you know, what they're sampling is not too uh, different from the population in New York, right? So you would expect, again, about half and half male and female, you know, some demographic distribution. And you can see that, for example, here it's, you know, um, in New York, they're, you know, 16%, so one in six people are over 61. Uh, and, you know, this sample is obviously more heavily weighted towards those. No, so finally we get to, uh, you know, the, the pay dirt, which is, uh, uh, you know, what was the uh, prevalence of um, uh, COVID in the sam sample population? You can see this is weekly data, um, you know, starting uh, following the first week, so 9th through 16th of February. So in this case, they had no cases. But notice, um, you know, uh, and again, remember the first case was reported in um, uh, March uh, 1st. But going to this retrospective sample, you can see that, you know, somewhere two weeks prior to this, there were already cases. And if you think about what they're measuring, they're measuring antibodies. 
right? They're measuring antibodies, which means that you, this person that was positive on the 23rd of February was probably infected two weeks prior to this. So now we're pushing the time point all the way almost to the beginning of February, which is kind of a ballpark estimate that the virus was in New York at appreciable amounts, kind of spreading uh, through the population, probably a month before the first case was detected. And every time there's an outbreak or a pandemic of this sort, this is always happening. I mean, there's always, by the time you realize that something is um, uh, afoot, you know, it's more than one case, especially in a situation like this. And then, uh, you know, for each time point, they measure uh, the actual value. So in this case, three out of 213, so prevalence of, uh, you know, 1.4%, and they put error bars in each estimate. Uh, so you can see, you know, because it's a small sample, it's in somewhere between zero and 5%, but it's not too. Um... And then you have, you know, this basically stays, stay low. And then all of a sudden you have this explosion of cases, right? And that's because this is when you had, you know, more and more and more people come into the hospital for COVID to the point where, you know, 56 or almost six out of 10 uh, at the peak uh, were um, uh, antibody positive. Right, and then it sort of tails off, and then it stays here, right? At a more or less steady level of about 23%. Uh, now, this is a different way to look at uh, the same data uh, because here it just tells you present or absent. So yes, antibody, no antibody. Uh, here you have some detail about how much antibody there is, right? So the more antibody there is, you can, view, you can view this as a proxy for how severe the infection was. Because if we remember, you know, from our discussion about immunology, there's, um, you know, sort of worst cases of COVID-19 were associated with uh, a higher antibody titers. Not one-to-one, -one, but sort of a uh, you know, rule of thumb. So the beginning, you know, low titers, and then you get into the peak epidemic and all the way through, uh, you have a distribution Right, obviously, you know, these, this is sort of a quality. You see it's a factor of two, you know, 50, 100. So you have a lot of points clumping there. There's quite a range. But there's no severe cases up to this point. And then you get into the peak of the epidemic and it's basically all over the scale. So you have severe cases and, you know, all the way down. And the, the median is sort of in the low, uh, uh, you know, the, the low range. So a lot of the cases are asymptomatic. Uh, if you look at the routine uh, group, you see the same uh, pattern of early emergence. So the first or the second week, they already had you know, about 1% of cases. And then because these are not people that are looking for COVID. And if you remember, you probably had, you know, there, there's also social uh, dynamic change here because people were probably not, uh, you know, keen to go to a hospital, you know, during the peak of the epidemic and a lot of the electives uh, were canceled. So this is not a truly representative sample, but the point here is that you have a much lower uh, prevalence, uh, which is still quite substantial, and you don't have these dramatic peaks um, as you had for the, um, the ICU case. But you have exactly the same um, pattern of antibody titers, so there's no difference between uh, you know, the routine care group and the um, uh, emergency group. Uh, and here they break things down based on, uh, you know, which group they looked at. So, you know, there's some variations. There's not too much you can read into this. You know, OBGYN, oncology, surgery, cardiology, and other office visits. Um, you know, some of these are quite small samples. And you might imagine that people, uh, you know, that went to cardiology and didn't have COVID, they probably did this because, you know, they, uh, they, they took precautions and they might have realized that there were. Uh... Yeah, so um, it seems like... Uh, the question is oncology had the highest peak. No, oncology had, it seems like there's oncology, it's panel B. If there's the highest peak looks like an OBGYN, right? It's almost up to 30% oncology, sort of, you know, the same as uh, uh, cardiology towards the end. Yeah, but this is such a small sample. There's basically no, so just four out of six. Uh, and there was another question. I think it would be interesting to see data on patients who are exposed to COVID-19 in hospital outpatient settings. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, there are studies on, on um, not necessarily patients, but there are definitely studies on healthcare uh, providers uh, that, that I, I don't have anything in, in this lecture, but uh, I mean, you can easily look it up. There have been a number of studies that looked at um, COVID-19 infections and nurses and doctors and, uh, you know, emergency responders in general. Um, and, 
you know, here you can see that in the urgent care group, uh, there's a, you know, a statistically significant, but not, you know, overwhelmingly dramatic uh, increase in titers. So people in the urgent care groups tended to have more severe uh, cases of COVID-19, you know, nothing too surprising here. I mean, it's, that's one way to read this study. Um, so the, um, uh, just to quote uh, the conclusions, um, SARS-CoV-2 was likely introduced to the New York City area several weeks earlier than previously assumed. Uh, we estimate that by the week ending May 24th, approximately 1.7 million individuals had been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And because there were um, on the order of um, 17,000 uh, deaths in New York City, you know, just divide one by the other, you get a preliminary infection fatality rate of 0.97%, which is actually quite high, right? And this is one of the highest, uh, you know, estimates you will see. So roughly one in a hundred um, uh, who get COVID will die uh, based on this estimate. Question is why would different specialties have different significant uh, uh, differences in the number of cases? So you mean, you know, why there are different trends? Um, that's a good question, but I mean, some of it is, uh, it's just, just really poor sampling, right? So for instance, here you get to the point like with surgery, right? Um, all the elective surgeries were effectively canceled. So there are like no cases at the end of March. And here you're drawing your conclusions based on, you know, one out of nine. So if you look at those confidence intervals, there's almost no precision there at all. So we don't have much information about what was going on uh, with a surgery. OBGYN, on the other hand, you don't get to choose, uh, you know, when you deliver, uh, right? So you, you have to be, uh, that, that's just basically a sample of the uh, general population. Um, and the same with oncology, uh, right? So it's basically, it's more, you know, when, when, when things resolved and, you know, this pop, people started going back to the hospital, pretty much all settled down to, you know, more or less the same level. Um, but a, a, an important point to keep in mind is that, you know, your eye is naturally drawn to tracing the, the curve they plotted, but just keep in mind that these error bars are quite wide. So, you know, it's, it's probably better viewed as a, as a band. Uh, around this curve, uh, which is how it might have been drawn, but here it wasn't. So 1%, right, give or take, based on this New York City estimate. Um, there's just one study. Um, so let's look at, um, you know, some of the others. And this is an ascent, I mean, this is a very, very important number because the way you will approach uh, a pathogen uh, will be qualitatively different if it's something that kills, say, you know, 50% of the population, this is apocalyptic, um, Right, something that kills 10% of the population, which is you know catastrophic, uh, you know the level of a major war, uh, you know down to you know a couple of percent, then one percent, then 0.1 percent, then 0.01 percent, and at some point you just basically say, you know it's it's just a normal, uh, 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 you know normal pathogen. At some point the risk isn't uh, sufficient for you to uh, you know justify a response. You know, for example, we don't respond to the seasonal cold even though there's an occasional death, but it's simply not uh, dangerous enough. So there's a big difference, in other words, between the way you would respond to path pathogen, uh, pathogen that has um, you know, a 1% uh, fatality rate uh, versus 0.1%. Uh, it's a tenfold difference. Um, or, so what, what is the actual number? Um, so let's look at some of the other studies. And one of the things, that we'll, this is a difficult number to pin down to this point, to this, uh, uh, as we'll see, it varies uh, you know, from country to country, uh, and it varies based on the study uh, that was um, that was done. So, for instance, here's a um, uh, a different, a very very different approach to look at um, uh, uh, population level prevalence. Uh, it is also a cross sectional study. It is not um, localized to New York City anymore. It's also a convenient sample. Uh, so, in this case, you, you're looking at a large sample of um, so 28,503 uh, adult individuals that are receiving dialysis across 1,300 facilities across the United States. Um, obviously, you know, people that receive dialysis uh, have other conditions that have led them to, uh, uh, you know, need dialysis. So there's, there's some complicating factors there. Uh, but it represents um, sort of a vulnerable population. So you might want to look at this uh, from the standpoint of uh, you know, decision-making. They used a very similar approach, you know, slightly different um, 
assay. So again, the report 100% sensitivity, 99.8% specificity. I didn't look into the details here because you, know, you can if you want. Uh, this is the standard uh, workflow uh, of how the um, patients were selected. So you started with some large number of laboratory orders across this network of dialysis clinics. Uh, six were included because they didn't know if there were men or women. There wasn't sufficient record and that's an important covariate. So you want to know this, you know, 63,000 eligible for random sampling. You take a half of that, uh, uh, then, you know, you exclude some because they don't have samples and there's your uh, underlying sample. So here um, uh, is a view, um, sort of a nice um, geographic summary of uh, how uh, this prevalence uh, was distributed geographically. And now we're looking in July of 2020. So if you remember the course of the epidemic, um, you know, and we already looked at New York. So New York was hit very hard. So it was New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, uh, you know, Massachusetts, the big cities. So if you remember, there was an outbreak, um, you know, quite significant in, in New Orleans, Chicago. Uh, and there wasn't a whole lot at the time uh, in the Midwest and the Sun Belt. You know, if you did this study now, it would be uh, uh, quite different. There's no data from, uh, I believe this is Montana, uh, right? This funny shape is Idaho. This is Wyoming. If I remember my geography. So I think this is Montana, uh, right? I think so, because this, this is Minnesota and the two Dakotas. Um, all right, thank you. It is Montana. Um, all right, so you can see from um, uh, just looking at, at this map that you have significant geographic variation which goes from the point that at the time there was nothing in Nevada, right, 0%, to one in three in New York. And then you can look at, um, you know, how this all broke down by um, population, uh, by age, by sex, race, ethnicity. Um, and this is the, um, you know, zip code majority race and ethnicity, which is a proxy for uh, regional composition and the region. So the way to read this, um, is, um, you know, you look at each rate category and say age and years, there's this funny mark, which if you read down here says that this is different at p-value of 0.05, which means that uh, the positivity rates differed by age group. So they were significantly different between those that are old and those that are young. Uh, so there's the standardized adult population. Um, and then you have, you know, 9.8% uh, for 18 to 44. Um, you know, which translates to, you know, 9,000 out of 100,000, obviously, because it's, you know, 9.8%. Um, uh, standardized to the U.S. population. This is the raw number, and this is um, the uh, recounted based on, uh, you know, their sampling. Uh, you always do the standardization to make sure that the populations are comparable between different regions that might have different compositions of ages. Um, then, um, you know, there's no difference between uh, men and women, 9.3. Uh, there's uh, a, a significant difference by uh, race and ethnicity. Um, there's also a significant difference by the majority race of ethnicity of the region. And there's a significant difference, obviously, by looking at the map uh, among the regions. Um, all right, which brings me to this, um, uh, you know, really um, uh, interesting paper. Uh, which is probably, you know, if you were to pick one source, this is where I would look at, uh, because this is a very well done meta analysis. Uh, meta analysis is an analysis, an analysis that aggregates data from other analyses and sort of tries to pull, uh, uh, to pull information together to improve um, inference. So you have age specific COVID-19 death data from 45 countries. Uh, and you also have results of 22 CIRA surveys done in different countries, right? So this is now, you try to use worldwide information aggregate uh, this information into single analysis and do uh, large scale inference. Uh, I apologize for these um, letters. It's a preprint and I can't do anything. Uh, it's just part of the document. So just, just ignore those. Uh, it's article and advanced access um, article. Uh, so um, here's an interesting um, chart um, that is a little hard to read, but let me see if I can explain it. Uh, so First, you have five different plots. They're all for different um, continents. So you have Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, and South America. Uh, you have age groups on the x-axis, 
and you have relative risks. Um, so relative means relative to what? And it's relative to uh, uh, the band of 55 to 59 year olds. So if your risk of you know, dying from COVID um, is one, whatever it is, uh, in 55 to 59, and if, you know, if it's below one, you're less likely to die than that age group. And if it's above one, you're more likely to die than this age group. And this is a logarithmic scale. So you, you, this is one, this is one in 100, uh, and this is 50. So you see this very well um, uh, recognized by now pattern, where if you look at very young uh, population, uh, there's this log linear relationship between how young you are um, and how likely you are to die from COVID. And then it continues, um, you know, past that point. You can see um, that um, so you know black points is what they've so so there's there's a lot of data uh, throughout this paper uh, that uh, is estimated by the model. So you know these these black dots um, are the estimates, uh, and the uh, colored dots are actual uh, values from the data. So this is sort of a smoothed aggregated estimate. You can see there's a lot more data from Europe than from everywhere else, a lot of the blue dots. Uh, there's not um, a whole lot of data from Africa. Uh, and, you know, there's, it's by country. Uh, so there's, you know, there are only so many countries in North America, which is why you see uh, this different density of uh, dots. But the pattern is the same everywhere, uh, right? The younger you are, the less likely you are to die from it. The older you are, uh, the worse it is, and it becomes progressively worse. And there are a lot of old people um, in Europe compared to these other sampled populations, which is why this uh, part extends further out. Um, here's another way um, uh, to do, um, sort of to look specifically into um, uh, the rate of deaths by um, uh, country in a specific age group. So in the high risk age group, uh, over 60, so dots um, is again something that was reconstructed by their model um, and bars is what was actually measured, uh, including standard deviations. Uh, there's some business about, and we'll talk about it, uh, the number of deaths. Um, uh, they had a little bit of a, uh, a struggle to do a fair comparison because as we'll see a little bit later on, you have to treat deaths that occurred in, in uh, nursing homes or assisted living facilities differently from what occurred in the general population. And uh, you know, so, so there was some confusion about that, but it's a stark, very, very stark uh, um, difference, right? So we're talking about uh, you know, deaths of you know, maybe one, um, uh, you know, this is instance per 100,000, so maybe on the order of tens per 100,000 in Norway, you know, to 300 in England, right? So when you, when you think about um, uh, uh, you know, writing your final report, you might want to ask yourself, you know, why was this, right? Did those countries really do, um, did they respond differently? So th was this a function of their uh, public health response or was this a function of something else? Uh, and here, um, again, we're trying to look for infection fatality rates. Um, and uh, this is sort of the money slide from this paper where you see data aggregated, um, so in this case, it's disaggregated by female and male. If you recall uh, from you know, both observational data and um, uh, sort of case reports, uh, men are hit by this disease harder than women, which you can see in the chart where blue dots are systematically higher for the same age group as the red dots. Uh, so these um, circle dots are um, model estimates and these um, are from individual countries. So you can see this is like, if you were to take a worldwide average, it would be these dots and individual countries are, are this big spread. Again, you can see that there's uh, a huge uh, variability. So there's, you know, they estimate um, a relatively higher risk group, which actually don't talk about it too much for really young children. And uh, then it's very, very low. So it's about one in a thousand, uh, sorry, one, about one in 10,000 uh, for or maybe even less. Uh, for young children, and then it sort of steadily marches on, crosses, you know, 1% at about 60, um, and then kind of, you know, creeps up further uh, the older you become. So, uh, 
uh, the stars, um, the stars um, uh, are, are sort of a, a different way to estimate. To, I, I believe that this has to do with the disaggregation between, uh, uh, you know, it's normal population deaths in nursing homes. Uh, and um, it's hard to say. I think the wider confidence intervals in younger children might have to do with the fact that there's so few um, actual deaths, right? And, 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 and maybe so few tests. But yes, wider intervals would, would indicate that there's less data uh, in, the, in this age group. Uh, now, this uh, is a view, uh, not by country, but by individual CIRA, CIRA survey, a uh, CIRA prevalence survey. So we discussed one from New York in the beginning in some detail, and then we discussed one from um, uh, the US dialysis centers, and these are 22 uh, studies that they put into this population, sorry, it put into this uh, meta-analysis where one uh, is picked arbitrarily to be this, um, you know, France population IFR. So again, it's just convenient to, uh, you know, sort of rate um, things. Um, uh, uh, sorry, it was standardized to the French population. Again, it's just, just so you can compare things uh, fairly between populations, right? And what this means is that if one country is systematically younger than the other, uh, which will be, say, the case for uh, you know, Kenya, it, is, it has a very different... Uh, uh, distribution of ages compared to uh, U European countries, so it's you know looks more uh, uh, you know there are a lot more younger people. Uh, you have to standardize the populations to have sort of the same fractions of young and old people, otherwise they're not directly comparable. So this is what that means: they standardize it to the population of France, right? So about the same fraction of people in each age group as there are in France, so you can directly compare them. Um, and then all the uh, CIRA surveys are ranked, uh, you know, from smallest infection. Uh, fat in infection fatality rate to highest. So you can see there's New York City, uh, which when standardized to the population of France uh, uh, would be over 2%, so that's definitely an outlier. Uh, then the next highest is Scotland, um, then another New York State, and it sort of marches down all the way. And then you see in places like, um, you know, say Kenya or Slovenia or Denmark, these CIRA surveys, you know, are very different uh, from what you see in New York. We're in, uh, you're now faced with a challenge. Uh, 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 if you are, you know, if you pick any one of these countries, for example, and if you want to look at the, uh, the appropriate response, just based on this, uh, you can already see that might not be such a thing as a universally appropriate response, simply because different countries face, you know, very different uh, types of uh, you know, fatality rates. Uh, you can look into this, you know, a little bit more, but you might, uh, you know, as a policymaker, you might want to do something qualitatively different between a place like Kenya, uh, where um, COVID-19 uh, seems to have an infection fatality rate, which is sort of in the same ballpark as a bad seasonal flu, higher, but not, you know, an order of magnitude higher, to where you get into New York and Europe, where it's 10 times higher, uh, or potentially even more than that for older people, dramatically more. So, you know, the response is now, has to be country calibrated. Uh, and finally, um, you can see um, um, at the um, sort of temporally speaking, you know, what was the attack rate? Um, so the attack rate is, you know, what fraction of the population was infected? Uh, so you expect these curves to increase over time, right? Because this is infection pathogen that spreads, infectious pathogen that spreads through the population. So eventually it'll infect more and more people. Uh, so you have um, individual countries. Uh, each one of these countries had at least one zero survey. So that's a black dot. That's when it was taken. So the X axis here is temporal axis, you know, from uh, March to September. You can see that Belgium was very, very well sampled. Uh, you know, uh, there's six CIRA surveys. There's one in the Czech Republic, a couple in Denmark, one in England, a bunch in Finland, um, you know, and a, and a bunch in Sweden. And you can see the countries had very, very different trajectories, even though they're all, um, uh, you know, sort of, a, a lot of them are um, European countries. There are a couple of uh, notable exceptions, you know, for example, Kenya. Uh, but you see that, you know, in some countries you had, uh, you know, pretty quick ramp up, you know, followed by uh, a flattening of the curve, but at very different levels. So in Belgium, it seems to sit just above 
whereas in England it's between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, you know, in Sweden you have five percent, in Spain you have five percent, and if you just take this um, as uh, uh, as one outcome measure, uh, the the one thing that you know that Spain and Sweden, for instance, uh, approached uh, handling COVID in very very different ways. So Sweden, you know, never implemented full lockdowns. They had some restrictions, but they were sort of the least um, interventional uh, country in Europe. Uh, where Spain, uh, you know, following an initial bad rash of cases, uh, you know, in major cities had a pretty severe uh, lockdown that was prolonged uh, and um, uh, dramatic. But if you hadn't known any of this, if you just look at, you know, the curves in these two countries, you know, these two particular curves look identical. Uh, which also is something that you need to consider uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of interventions. And Belgium looks pretty much identical. You know, Kenya looks quite different, England looks quite different. And you can see that some countries had a qualitatively different behavior. So Czech Republic, much slower, Finland, much slower, Slovenia, much slower. You might've seen Slovenia in the news uh, this week in the past because they're actually doing a national testing program uh, where the goal is to test every single um, Slovenian citizen or people that are in the country just to get a complete uh, count of uh, COVID-19 cases. But information like this is, is quite useful. I mean, it's retrospective, so you can't use it for uh, making decisions at the beginning of the epidemic, but this type of information is uh, very useful retrospectively when you might want to say, uh, you know, what, what might have influenced uh, the course of the epidemic. Uh, and there's a question about, um, yeah, so designing pub public health measures that differ based on geographic location. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think one of the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, approaches that I would have taken is definitely an adaptive strategy. It doesn't seem, you know, based on the data that we have, it doesn't make sense to do exactly the same thing, uh, say, in New York City uh, and small town in upstate New York, you know, where population density is very different, uh, you know, transmission dynamics are very different and everything else is very different. But it's easy to be, uh, you know, a Monday quarterback and you don't really have any skin in the game. So I don't envy any of the decision makers that had to make those decisions. Um, and here's um, another uh, way to look at uh, sort of relative country performance. Uh, and this is probably some of the most, they, they don't really interpret these figures very much in a, in a paper like this, but just present them and it, it, it kind of makes you think, because what's shown here uh, is a sort of relative excess of uh, deaths of people over 60 years old. So in the most vulnerable population, and you have to take one of the countries as a reference. So you take Chile as a reference, you standardize them to all the same populations, uh, right? You, you, you use um, their country um, level estimates and you project how many people you expect to die uh, in this age group. And if you have more people dying than expected, then your country sort of did relatively poor a relatively poor job uh, yeah, compared to the expectation than the countries that are in the negative. So, and it, it really, um, you know, it, 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 it's kind of striking, for example, that based on this estimate, um, uh, so expect, you know, Mexico has done remarkably well uh, and Belgium has done remarkably poor. You know, Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, just in terms of the excess of older people, uh, that died. Canada is actually, based on this metric, is doing worse than the United States. Uh, you know, we're sort of, um, you know, reasonably good. Um, so, unless I'm reading it backwards, it could be. So let's let's think. Observed minus expected incidence, right? So, you know, if observed minus ex expected difference is constant, so if observed difference is higher than expected, will be positive. Yeah. So go figure. Um, and then the final um, uh, uh, chart that I'd like to show you is an, uh, is an analysis of what they've, um, uh, the, the, they've tried to pay some attention to, um, you know, why uh, residents in the nursing homes were hit so hard. And one of the analyses that they did here uh, was to estimate, uh, you know, relative nursing uh, uh, home attack rate as a function of relative frailty. So, you know, frailty is just an index uh, to measure uh, sort of how sick uh, the population in a particular nursing home is. Uh, 
and as you would expect, the overall infection fatality rate uh, is is a uh, you know, very strong function of how frail the population is. Uh, right. So the uh, the sicker the people are, everything else being equal, the more they will die. Um, at a high rate, they will die. So you know, two percent, one percent, so on. Uh, sorry, any uh, any questions here? I think um, sort of the take home message is that uh, uh, we have now, you know, nine months, not not quite nine months, but you know, getting there uh, into the pandemic. We have a lot of data uh, to evaluate, uh, you know, various um, you know, actual taken, actual intervention strategies that were taken, you know, based on attack rates and death rates and, and, and curves. And we also finally have the data to estimate, um, you know, some of the important uh, perhaps the most critical uh, features of the uh, pathogen, which is how deadly it is. Uh, but when you write your project, you should think about the information that was available at the time when those decisions would have been made. So um, at the very beginning of the epidemic, where you do not have uh, uh, the luxury of going back and doing retrospective analyses on stored blood samples or doing, you know, uh, synth synthetic analyses on, on, on made ACR surveys, you have partial, incomplete information, uh, uh, and, and you have to base, to, to base your decisions on it. So the question is, we shouldn't use papers published after March and April 2020. That is, I wouldn't say you shouldn't use them. You should use them. Um, so to, to, to make it sort of fair to the decision makers, uh, you should try uh, to justify it based on the information that was available at that time. Right, yeah, maybe plus minus a couple of weeks, but you, you shouldn't take the information from uh, November and say, had I known back in March, I would have done this. But you can use the information uh, from later papers to evaluate uh, you know, how things, um, uh, or alternatively, you know, what, what I might suggest in this context uh, is that your policies should be adaptive, right? So you make one decision in March based on the information that you have, you know, the, the, then you review how it's doing. As then as new information comes in, you adjust it. Uh, and you know, from that perspective, you can use all the information you have because we should be constantly uh, adjusting and adapting. There, there's no reason to believe that you could have chosen the perfect. Anybody could have chosen the perfect response strategy right then. Uh, um, you know, and 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 it would not need any adjustments at all. Uh, so just to indicate, uh, sort of looking specifically at the adaptive and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, targeted interventions, um, I think it's instructive to look at uh, just, you know, how different uh, populations have been affected by uh, the virus. So we'll, we'll look, uh, we'll start by looking at a specific report, uh, an illustration of SARS-CoV-2 dissemination within a skilled nursing facility using heat maps literally just a case study. Uh, so it's a case report, right? It's not a systematic review or anything. It's just pre presenting the case of one uh, nursing facilities, one nursing facility. And it's a report that describes how uh, SARS-CoV-2, you know, disseminated and transmitted uh, through um, a skilled nursing facility during an outbreak, All right? So it's residents, uh, uh, the, the study uh, population or residents of a 150 bed um, SNF or skilled nursing facility. Uh, and what they did, um, they basically, I mean, you'll see these in a second, that they sort of generate maps uh, of the facility and where the cases were. So heat maps generated by the infection prevention team to track staff and resident symptoms and uh, test results to identify infection patterns. Uh, so this um, facility experienced uh, what was designated a severe outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 early in the pandemic. Uh, this is fairly descriptive. I mean, you have to keep in mind that nursing facilities uh, are uh, at the house already uh, in, uh, individuals with advanced age, and in many cases, like in this facility, particularly frail subjects. So this was an, uh, a, a facility that um, uh, catered to medically frail, cognitively impaired individuals with 99% of residents carrying a dementia diagnosis. So you might imagine this is a particularly challenging population to um, intervene upon. 
is depending on the stage of the dementia, the patients may or may not be aware uh, of what's happening and may or may not be able to follow you know, designated prevention procedures. Uh, the initial cluster of uh, residents with symptoms in the first confirmed case um, occurred um, in the dementia care unit. And then as they say, at the time, lack of resources prevented timely and accurate identification and cohorting of cases. Uh, so here's um, uh, uh, just a, a view of how uh, uh, this went. So this is from late March. I don't have the date here, but if you look at the original paper, I believe this is March 27th. Uh, so here you have the original positive case. This is a physical map of the facility. So you can see their individual rooms. They're sort of, there's a quad kind of situation. So court, courtyard one, courtyard two, dining area, shared areas, you know, lobby and individual uh, rooms with either private or semi-private. So one or two individuals. So here you have um, an index case that was positive, tested, and these individuals with symptoms. So you can see it's you know, localized to the swing, but it's already you know, over here with symptoms and tested. Uh, now this is four days later, I believe, um, where now you have um, you know, positive cases are now, so this was the index case, now you have new positive, multiple positive cases, you have symptoms basically all over the wing. Um, you, 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 they sort of started testing in the other wing as well. Uh, and by April 17th, so three weeks later, now notice this, and this is you know, quite depressing because now you have this pink dot. So you have a large number of individuals, pretty much half of the population is uh, both uh, unit A and unit B are dead. Um, and there's positive and symptoms basically in the entire facility. Um, now, this is the important thing to realize is that this was a facility that tried to do everything they could think of to, to uh, at the time, this is again early in the outbreak, uh, so they were not negligent, you know, they didn't just let the virus spread through, so they had undetected asymptomatic transmission, led to severe outbreak with significant morbidity and mortality, and the key is undetected asymptomatic. Uh, the virus spread widely through the building despite multiple control measures, including, you know, visitor exclusion, so no visitors allowed, frequent symptom screening of residents and staff, contact and droplet precautions for symptomatic residents, universal masking and aggressive social distancing policies. So pretty much everything, you know, that we're sort of doing as a society in terms of, uh, you know, controlling the infection. But here, uh, you know, basically everything happened before any, before any of the measures were implemented. And the presumed index cases were two staff members who were asymptomatic when they worked, but later developed symptoms and eventually tested positive. Um, and this story sort of repeated itself multiple times uh, through nursing homes in the US uh, and, and, and in other countries, and just the rate at which this spreads. So you went from first case in the end of March, you know, less than three weeks later, you have, you know, 20 to 30 dead in your facility, despite, you know, doing, you know, all these measures so it indicates that at some point uh, you're simply not able to control it in an environment like this, you know, without, I don't even know what you might do at the time, sort of universal test if you could have done this and then, you know, isolate negatives and positives, physically separate them and don't let them communicate. So it's hard to think what well, you could have done better in retrospect. It's just really brutal in, in this setting. Um, and if you read, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a companion paper uh, in the same issue. Uh, I think this is American Journal of Geriatric uh, Science. I don't uh, remember exactly, but you can look it up. Uh, so there was an editorial to accompany this case report called COVID-19 Nursing Homes Calming the Perfect Storm. And just to quote something uh, you know, from this paper, so because of the elements of the perfect storm, nursing homes are like a tinderbox and it only takes one person to start a fire that could cause many deaths in a single facility. Uh, you know, an average of 44% to 45% of COVID-19 related deaths nationwide occur in people cared for in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. I'm sure you've heard it was a large fraction, but I'm not sure you, you might have realized it was this large of a fraction. Infection rate amongst assisted living facility residents is five times the national average. You have 24% of facilities at at least one virus positive resident and 8% in outbreaks of at least 10 cases. Um, uh, among the viral positive residents, 43% were hospitalized and 31% died. 
uh, right? So if you have this information, you know, one of the um, obvious uh, takeaways from this, and they're particularly uh, un, uh, uh, sort of particularly difficult uh, environments, you know, where you have a lot of uh, uh, old and often frail people living in confined um, environments with regular contact, especially early in the epidemic when you, had a, you didn't appreciate the extent of asymptomatic transmission. Um, you know, by the time you realize that something's wrong, it's too late to do anything. Uh, yes, yeah, so it really takes just, you know, one case. Um, uh, and, and if you remember, going back to my first uh, paper from this lecture about uh, New York, uh, you know, by the time you realize that something was wrong, those was, was already three or four weeks too late uh, to sort of control the uh, thing in a population. Uh, now, looking to the sort of completely opposite side um, uh, of the risk spectrum uh, is, it yeah, would be uh, little children, uh, because based on all the information that we have, unlike the seasonal flu, uh, COVID-19 is an unusually mild disease in that population. So for example, in the UK, despite the fact that they have, um, you know, that the, the, they're now, uh, you know, instituting, I believe starting today, a second round of lockdowns, uh, their um, public school system, especially elementary schools, had been open, and I believe they remain open. So. One of the, uh, and if as a policy decision maker, you obviously want to, uh, you know, balance um, uh, you know, public health versus a lot of other considerations. You know, for example, closing schools on its own brings significant costs, which we may, you know, we'll discuss a little bit next week. So it's not a decision that you can easily take. Uh, I mean, you're experiencing school closure at the moment. It's not quite the same as elementary school, uh, you know, because as a college student, you're more uh, uh, able to uh, work remotely. Uh, but there's uh, a preprint that just um, appeared on MedArchive, uh, just a couple of weeks old. Association between living with children now comes from COVID-19 and open safely cohort study of 12 million adults in England. So, and let me sort of preface this study by why I think it's such an um, sort of an interesting study is because uh, you, you, I'm sure you've often heard arguments that even though children themselves uh, might not get sick, even if they contract uh, the virus, they might increase the risk of adults that they'll live with by bringing the disease home and perhaps increasing the risk of COVID-19 infections or COVID-19 hospitalizations or complications. This study directly measured whether or not that's the case. So this is a, a really, really uh, you know, beautifully executed study of a fairly difficult to track questions, which is exactly, do you have does the fact that you live with children, uh, they go to school and see other children, uh, does it influence uh, the outcomes from COVID-19 in you as an adult? And this is a very, very large scale study. So it involves 12 million adults in England. So this is truly a population level survey. Uh, just to recap uh, what I said, children often become vectors of disease spread. And we all know this. Um, I mean, children uh, uh, are exposed uh, to more pathogens. They, you know, uh, uh, interact with other children uh, on a regular basis, uh, you know, go to school, you know, they do things that might be unsanitary and, you know, they bring disease home. But there are actually two possibilities. It could be a good thing. One of the, uh, uh, and a good thing might um, occur because if you get um, uh, a common cold infection, uh, that is, you know, annoying, but in no way dangerous to you. You might remember from our immunology lectures, there's quite a bit of evidence uh, that getting this infection provides cross-reactive immunity through T cells uh, due to more frequent prior infections from seasonal coronaviruses. That was an interesting finding that was, that was, that was quite, uh, quite significant. Uh, you know, and then the downside, um, you know, if they actually bring COVID-19 home or SARS-CoV-2, you might contract it from them. And it might, you know, translate to uh, a more significant risk uh, for you as an adult. Uh, in order to address this question, uh, the study used data from approximately 40% of all of England to compare whether uh, to compare what effect living with small children might have on various SARS-CoV-2 related outcomes. Uh, this is, you know, there's a lot of debate of um, 
you know, various advantages and disadvantages of, of uh, you know, nationalized versus distributed healthcare systems. Doing a study like this in the United States uh, would be quite impossible simply because there's not a single data system that contains information about 40% of subjects, you know, population in a state, let alone the entire country. The closest you could come to would be a hospital network study, you know, and, and people have actually done this, like Kaiser Permanente, for example, or some other large hospital systems will occasionally do uh, very large studies like this, but they are uh, by necessity uh, uh, not driven by um, government research, they're driven by uh, hospitals. So this, you know, a survey of this kind is pretty much uh, uh, predicated on having standardized, um, you know, national level health systems. So, and we benefit from it because, you know, we, we can learn from what um, England uh, has discovered. Uh, here's a uh, flow chart of how this um, study population uh, was filtered through various stages. Uh, so the, this, this started with a population registered with a general practice. So, you know, family practitioner, uh, GP is an analog of that in the UK. Uh, using this particular kind of software on the 1st of February of 2020, and at least three months follow-up. I mean, you want follow-up because you want to be able to catch uh, COVID-19 infections. If you don't have follow-up, that's pointless. Uh, so that the initial population is 23.2 uh, million. Uh, you know, you, you start shunting people off because they don't meet study criteria, so no valid household ID, probably means you can't track them down. But individuals with household IDs, then you exclude um, sort of unusually large uh, groups of people, households which are flagged as care homes or have more than 10 persons in them, um, right? So this is um, sort of deemed unrepresentative, too large. Uh, individuals and households excluding homes with greater than 10 persons or care homes, which is just under 20 million. Uh, then you also exclude people that don't have uh, required demographic information because you want to put that as a covariate in the analysis. Uh, exclude people that are children, because you know you're you're only interested in this case in the effect on adults, um, and then uh, you in, you also exclude a small number of people that are very old. Uh, I'm actually curious how many people over the age of 110 uh, are are in the UK. There might be a couple. Uh, this is a very very advanced age. Uh, died or had COVID before 1st February 2020. So you're um, and then you also exclude individuals with missing data and ethnicity. So the final cohort, and this is obviously a very, very large cohort. So you have 9.1 million of adults between 18 and 65, and you have 2.5 million of adults uh, over 65. It's a very large study population. So you should have great power to detect things. As a um, uh, sort of clinical trial uh, cohort type of study, uh, you need to define what it is that you look for. Uh, so there were four outcomes that they tracked uh, by increasing degree of severity. Uh, so did people become infected with SARS-CoV-2? Uh, if they did become infected, were they admitted uh, to the hospital? If they were admitted to the hospital, did they need intensive care? And lastly, did they die? So, you know, uh, a, a progression of uh, severity and outcomes. So here's um, you know, one way to view these data, uh, which is you have um, uh, specific events that they tracked over time. Uh, so this would be event A, you know, uh, outcome one, where uh, somebody became infected with COVID-19. Um, it kind of tracks what we know by the national epidemic where there wasn't uh, you know, very much in the beginning because there was no COVID uh, February. And then you know, April was the peak epidemic and then kind of settled down. Date of admissions to hospitals and even sharper peak around April, tailing off. Date of admission to ICU, similar peak. Uh, date of uh, death from COVID-19, similar peak with a tail. And then this, you can almost view this as a control. Uh, this would be death in this very large cohort uh, you know, people uh, among 10 million individuals that they studied, or over 10 million, you know, a fair number of them will die from natural causes or old age. Uh, and you expect this to basically be flat, 
right? Because this is uncoupled from COVID-19. This is just your normal background rate of death, which has some seasonality in it, if you remember from the uh, uh, lecture last time when we looked at excess uh, deaths. So we had, uh, you know, some seasonal variation, but not much. Now, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but one of the, um, I, just, I just want you to realize that when you do this type of um, analysis, there's a lot of you know, complicated statistics involved because what you want to do is you want to say, how does household exposure, which is this, to children, this is kind of a very dry way to say you have children living in your household under the age of 18, how does this affect the outcome? And the outcome is severe COVID-19. So you want to, you know, study the effect of children on severe COVID-19, but there are a lot of other variables in play. So for example, severe COVID-19 is not a direct outcome. It's an outcome of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So being uh, exposed to children might uh, uh, lead to SARS-CoV-2 infection, which might lead to COVID-19. But there are a lot of other variables that are involved in complicated ways with both the exposure and the outcome. So for instance, uh, the sex uh, of uh, the adult in question has an effect on severe COVID-19 directly because we know from other data that men are more susceptible than women. And sex might also have um, an effect on whether or not you have children living in your household. So for example, you know, and, and it would be quite different because if you're a woman of a specific age, uh, you know, you're more likely to live with children uh, than, you know, if you're a man of uh, a more advanced age or something like this. Or, so, but this is all confounded, right? So, and if you start tracking all the other covariates, so you have age, it's a, co it's a covariate of severe COVID-19, right? The older you are, but it also influences other things. It influences whether or not you have children. There's a specific you know, age in which you're the most likely to have children. Um, it also influences how many people you live with. It influences whether or not you have other chronic conditions that influence COVID-19 and so on. So this is a complicated um, uh, sort of statistical framework where you try to put all the variables together that you can think of can uh, modulate uh, the relationship between household uh, exposure and severe COVID-19. And you write down a statistical model that encodes these dependencies. So if you have an arrow, it means that one variable influences the other. And there's color coded here. So, uh, you know, you're, this, what you want to measure is you want to measure the effect of household exposure to children on severe COVID-19, but it goes through all of these covariates, which is why they needed to measure them for all the population, because any of these things can modify the exposure. And in a study like that, having a very careful analysis of all the other covariates and how they might influence one another, is absolutely essential. Otherwise, you cannot draw any conclusions if you don't account for the fact that you know household exposure to children is confounded with other things. You can't tease apart the effect of just that additional variable without accounting for everything else. Um, and this is a really um, I, I thought you know was a nice way uh, to graphically summarize what it is that they um, you know put into uh, the model. Uh, and finally, if you look at the results. Um, we have seen uh, these types of um, hazard uh, or relative risk uh, maps uh, multiple times now in, in case control trials and observational trials, uh, which is you try to summarize, you know, after passing your data through a complicated statistical model accounting for covariates, you know, how does what you want, the exposure to a specific child, you know, living in your household or just the presence of young children or uh, teenagers, uh, affects uh, the risk of infection. One is the reference. So this is no exposure to children. And, you know, this is, this is basically all you need to see from um, uh, this uh, study. Uh, if um, uh, the dots themselves are point estimates, so this is what they estimated from the model, the bars is the confidence interval. If the confidence interval does not overlap one, you read this as a statistically significant difference. So for example, um, if um, in your household, you have children aged between zero and 11 years, you have what looks like you know, a 3% uh, increased risk uh, of getting SARS-CoV-2 
but it's not statistically significantly different from one. And if you cannot find that in a population of 12 million people, it's just not there, right? So this is just not a significant effect. If you have children that are teenagers, so over than 12 years old, uh, there is a small but statistically significant increase in your getting an infection. However, uh, getting an infection on its own is undesirable, but it's not terrible. You know, now we're getting into uh, you know, more severe outcomes. So what is the risk, relative risk of be being admitted to the hospital for COVID-19 if you have children? And if you look at these estimates, there's no difference. Um, you know, they're point estimates that are a little bit to each side, but there's the confidence interval is uh, too wide, right? So there's no statistical difference, no difference uh, for being admitted to ICU. And it seems to be a protective effect of having children. So you have a significantly lower risk of dying from COVID-19 if you have young children. Uh, and you also have a statistically significant risk of just not dying if you have children. So think of this as a sort of a, a, an interesting and counterintuitive uh, uh, example where having children seems to be protective against death in general uh, for you know, statistically an average, but this is also biological imperative and a lot of things are written into it. So people um, with children um, just, just die at a slower rate than people without children. Uh, and that, is already, that already accounts for age effects and everything else because they put into the model. So there's an additional factor that's not directly included in the model. And you can, you know, you can think of this as people that have children take fewer risks, you know, they don't smoke, they might you know, not drive aggressively and do other things that you know, stop them from dying of other causes. Um, but and even so this is adults 65 and under right so this is your typical sort of parental uh, uh, group even though uh, I'm not aware of very many people that have children you know at the age of 65 um, they exist um, Sean Connery who um, recently died um, you know, rest in peace uh, I think he had a, he had children when he was quite uh, an advanced age maybe not maybe I, I, it, one of the famous British actors did um, Adults over 65, and this is an important figure because now, uh, you know, this is, this is a lot of the times you hear that one of the uh, significant uh, uh, factors that might influence decisions about whether or not you send children to school, you know, is whether or not uh, they, uh, their infections, oh, they're, 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 the potential that they might bring infection home would affect their grandparents. So this is over age 65, this is the high risk group. And according to the study, if you, can, if you look at it, there's no difference uh, for this age group either. Uh, so, you know, a slightly higher point estimate, not statistically significant, basically nothing, right? There's no effect whatsoever. Uh, as a summary, um, this study observed no increased risk of recorded infections or serious COVID-19 outcomes among working age adults sharing a household with children aged zero to 11 years compared to those living without children, but a reduced risk of death from COVID-19. Similar in magnitude to the reduction in risk of death from causes other than COVID-19 seen in working age adults living with children of all ages, there is a small increase in rate of SARS-CoV-2 infection in those living with teenagers, but no impact in outcomes. See, what about adults with siblings that are nine to 10 years in the household? Would those adults be considered even though they weren't parents? Uh, yeah, so in this case, um, um, I mean, if you read the, the inclusion uh, criteria, all you have to do is be over 18 and live in, in the same household unit. Uh, so that would include, there, there was no restriction on, you know, whether or not you were related uh, through biological, you know, as biological parents or siblings, uh, I, I would imagine, you know, if, if there's, an, um, if there's a, an adult child living in the same household, that would be counted as an independent adult, unless they were in the household with more than 10 people. So I think they, uh, you know, very, very large multi-generational households were probably not included. Perhaps because there are not enough of them or they just have very different dynamics and are, are hard to study. Uh, so there are limitations. To the study. All right, so um, 
let me um, switch over to a, a different screen for a moment. So I just wanted to um, you know, show you a couple of um, uh, interesting resources uh, that are linked. Linked in the, uh, sorry, linked in the presentation. Um, and you can actually, um, they're interesting in their own right, but you could definitely, uh, you, you might want to use them for uh, you're doing your research. So this is a, um, we call a crowdsourced um, dashboard, which tracks uh, multiple schools in the United States. Uh, and um, there's, um, you know, something, let's see. So if you scroll down, uh, sorry, I lost my mouse pointer, there we go. Um, so they, um, they uh, represent, uh, you know, uh, schools from all over the state, uh, all over the United States. So for example, there are 390 schools in Pennsylvania uh, that participate, so participation rate is different, but it's there, so you have regional density. You know, most of them are urban schools. You know, have public schools mostly, but private independent schools as well. Uh, and you also have um, uh, schools that are uh, operating in different uh, capacities. So for example, you have 16% of these schools uh, that have full capacity, which means you know full-time in-person learning. Uh, you have 72% uh, in-person reduced capacity. So, for example, you know I have two H school children that go to the Lower Marion School District, and they are doing hybrid model. So, you know half day uh, a remote, half day cohort study. Then you have remote learning only, and just you know school not in session. Um, so this is a very large um, sort of aggregated data sets. And these are neat summary statistics that will show you, and you can slice and dice it whichever way you want. Uh, but these are uh, uh, summary statistics over everything, right? So, for example, here's the uh, you know time series of what fraction of uh, students have a confirmed case over the entire study population. So there is you know uh, about one in a thousand at the moment. Um, and the daily case rate um, is um, uh, per thousand individuals is you know nine per hundred thousand. Uh, you can see the same for staff, uh, you know, daily case rate for staff. And you can also see various mitigation strategies that are being adopted right now. So staff masks, increased ventilation, student masks, you know, reduced population or cohorting, uh, you know, daily at home screen, um, right? But that's, that's basically self-reporting. It's one of those things that, um, for example, here, um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not like you have to go to an app and fill it out. It's just if you, if you have symptoms, um, or anybody in the household has symptoms, you're supposed to report them and uh, not, not send your kids to school and so on. Um, and you have, um, you know, a share of schools with large outbreaks. Uh, but this is sort of live data uh, to show you what's happening in, in all these schools in the United States. You can, uh, you know, filter them down. Uh, for example, you can see what's happening in uh, you know, Pennsylvania. Uh, Right, so you know, Pennsylvania, there is, uh, uh, there's gonna be a much smaller data set, but for example, here you see that all the schools that participate in Pennsylvania, they have a very uniform uh, um, mitigation strategy. Uh, you could also look, uh, oh, these are private schools. This, these are old schools, uh, right? You can also choose by, you know, you, you can start comparing things based on, for example, you know, what mitigation strategies you use um, and so on. So this is um, sort of live data that you could say, just do a side-by-side -side comparison, you know, how are different states are doing, how different uh, strategies of mitigation doing, and you might want to track, uh, you know, for example, your case rate uh, might be one of the uh, outcomes that, uh, that you're interested in. So I, this is um, kind of a, a, a very, interesting, in my view, uh, data-driven approach to uh, basically make decisions uh, in an informed matter. Now that we're doing these different things, you should be able to compare them uh, in a systematic way instead of relying on anecdotes, for instance. Uh, 
Um, all right, there's another um, interesting resource that I thought. So this is um, this is actually a commercial um, provider. They're, um, they they do um, you know uh, um, their their business is to actually look at uh, generate reports that can be you know paid for and and, and used for decision making. But they also provide you know a fair number of free resources. Uh, so one of the interesting things that I thought I might show you is um, the rate of testing by country. Uh, and this is just an interesting number as of uh, November 4th. So you can see, uh, you know, some expected and some unexpected patterns. So, you know, Ch for example, where at the moment, uh, you know, number two in the world, just after China in terms of the number of tests done uh, and per capita, we've yes. done the most tests probably, um, uh, Oh, maybe not the most, but you know, uh, it it doesn't actually show you these these data, but it, it's it's a large number of tests. It's a it's a far cry from uh, 500 tests a day, which was done in New York at the beginning of March. Um, and they also uh, they also have aggregate statistics for um, um, you know other other countries as well. Um, and then. Um, Moving on, if you want to see uh, the resources that are available, um, and we'll, this is just a good resource for you to look at uh, when you want to see you know, what are the current thoughts on uh, mitigation strategies, for instance. Um, this is just a CDC, CDC portal uh, where you can go and look at uh, sort of various recommendations. So, you know, they have their guidance documents. Uh, you can look at contact tracing to so understand what it is. Um, I'm not gonna talk about it very much because I don't really want you to go into too much detail. Contact tracing is uh, you know, one of the things you hear about. Um, it is not uh, you know, entirely clear uh, how useful it is at this point uh, you know, for uh, the generalized epidemic like the United States, but it might be highly relevant if you're looking uh, to write about responses and more uh, uh, isolated countries, for instance, New Zealand, which has taken a very, very different approach. Uh, they really do, you know, track uh, very aggressively, you know, any cases that they can find because their goal is to uh, stop transmission. Um, and because of the responses and the, the unique uh, uh, sort of the fact that New Zealand is a fairly remote island nation and they can, uh, you know, much better control, uh, you know, travel. Um, and they were they did it early. They were basically able to. Um, uh, uh, do things that were not an option really in the United States because by the time anything was, uh, you know, any mitigation strategies could have been undertaken. There were, was already a lot of uh, community spread. Uh, and then um, moving back to my presentation, Let's see if there are any. Um, so I'm actually going to, not going to talk about, um, SARS-CoV-2, but I want to, uh, basically mention all the relevant things based on a study that was done about a different pathogen in the past, uh, just to, de to demonstrate, uh, that there are a lot of things we still do not know about SARS-CoV-2. One of the, um, uh, uh significant uh, determinants of how you might deal with a pathogen is understanding how it spreads. So obviously, SARS-CoV-2 is a transmissible pathogen. Obviously, it's airborne. Obviously, it can trans transmit from individual to individual. Uh, but in a way, it's not you know that different uh, from other respiratory illnesses. Uh, in, in fact, a lot of the studies that were done prior to COVID-2 didn't really break out respiratory illnesses into different categories. They were just looking at a viral respiratory infection. And there are easily you know, about 30 years of research in influenza to try to understand how it is transmitted and how you can stop its uh, transmission through uh, you know, simple uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. 
So there's a paper, I believe it appeared in 2013, uh, a, a review paper entitled Roots of Influenza Transmission. Um, I would just like, you know, sort of pull out one um, sentence from the abstract. It summarizes it pretty well. Uh, remarkably little is known definitively about the modes of influenza transmission. Uh, this should give you pause, right? Because how long, I mean, we've had multiple, you know, three uh, major uh, influenza pandemics or epidemics in the 20th century. Uh, the worst one in recent history is still the Spanish flu, the pandemic of 1918. So we've been living with influenza for centuries. Uh, what is it that, um, you know, why don't we still definitively understand how it is transmitted? And, you know, how does this influence the recommendations and the decisions that you might make about stopping the transmission? Uh, you will see in, in having just recently read uh, a paper on um, sort of masks, uh, in the context of COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, you will recognize a lot uh, of the same terminology. So SARS-CoV-2 SARS and you know, viral uh, influenza are not that different. So you can imagine three uh, routes of transmissions. It has, I mean, the viral particle has to be delivered physically from an infected host to a, to a, uh, a susceptible host, and it has to land somewhere what, what it can infect, right? So it has to land, you know, say on, um, depending on, on, on the virus uh, specific tissue, uh, right? So for um, influenza, for example, it is important whether or not uh, you're able to, uh, the virus is able to penetrate deep enough to reach the lungs. So you have uh, three routes of transmission. You can have large particles or droplets. So these are greater than equal to 10 microns. They can be inhaled, but they're too large to reach the lungs. You can have small particles, uh, which are categorized as under five microns aerosols that can be in inhaled and reach the lungs. There have been, uh, you know, very very intense and you know sophisticated research on you know the physics of masks and and and, and the flow of particles now with SARS-CoV-2 with molecular dynamics simulations and you know all these studies that would just were never done for influenza. Uh, you have contact transmission as well, so particles are directly transferred through contact. So you, you know either physical contact from an infected person or via contaminated object or person. All right, so this has to do with you know cleaning surfaces. Um, and uh, transmission of any pathogen is going to be modulated by a large number of factors that are difficult to um, sort of arrange in terms of importance, uh, but they all could play a significant role. Uh, so, you know, you can start by looking at the person that is, uh, that might be infected. So in fact, T, you know, what's their age? What's their immunity status, right? Have they, this is relevant for SARS-CoV-2 as well. Similarly, the infector, do they have symptoms? You know, what type of social interactions, you know, are they actually, act, are they shedding the virus, which means are they releasing viral particles and it depends on the stage of infection, a lot of other things. Uh, viral factors, you know, where did they actually land? Was, was the virus able to survive? Uh, what are the environmental conditions? So temperature, humidity, ventilation, this all has to do with, you know, the physics of the particle, dispersal, survival, uh, you know, transportation, setting, you know, home, school, workplace, hospitals, so patterns of contacts. All of this plays a significant role. Um, and um, this particular paper reviewed several studies in non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, to quote from the paper again, a problem with using interventions to assess mod modes of transmission is that blocking one route still allows transmission to take place down other alternatives unblocked or open routes. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, something that you do not really do with SARS-CoV-2 is you can do human influenza challenge studies. You can actually ask volunteers you know, to be exposed um, to um, uh, influenza, although I presume you could ask volunteers to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2. I'm not immediately aware of these studies that have been done. Uh, and here's an interesting review. Um, again, it's just you know to put things in context because one of the things that I think is very important uh, is, is to realize that there were many infections before COVID. There'll be many infections after COVID, uh, and a lot of the things that we're trying now have been tried in other contexts. 
Uh, so here's an example of, uh, for example, trying you know, various intervention strategies uh, to reduce the rate of um, influenza transmissions. So here's a study year, you know, there's you know, the last you know, 15 years, here's how they were done. And you can see that these are actually proper clinical trials, right? So you can see cluster randomized control trial, randomized control trial, block randomized control trial. So they're all actual clinical trials designed in the same way as what we've discussed before. Um, and here's what they uh, wanted to uh, look for, right? Primary prevention, you know, secondary prevention and so on, comparative non-inferiority. This is where, um, you know, this is how uh, they were randomized. So when a cluster randomized means you don't randomize by individual, but you're randomized by a group of individuals. So in this case, it was a study that looked at different schools, study that looked at different university residents, residences, uh, households that included a set index case. So it's basically reducing transmission within households where one is infected, households, households, healthcare workers and hospitals, uh, healthcare workers and hospitals. And this is what they were comparing. So for influenza, sort of the standard types of uh, intervention would be, um, and the abbreviations are here, hand hygiene. Let's just, you know, wash your hands. Um, uh, you can have um, uh, SFM, so surgical face masks. And you can see in this case, you had basically hand hygiene versus control. Uh, you know, hand plus respiratory hygiene versus control, surgical masks and hand hygiene versus surgical masks and control. And are the major findings, right? So it's kind of all over the place. So you can see, you know, significant reductions in ILI. So ILI is an abbreviation for influenza-like illness. So in these studies, they typically don't test to see that you actually have an influenza. They just look for symptoms. A laboratory confirmed influenza, significant reductions, no difference, no difference, no difference, no difference, no difference. Uh, surgical masks were not inferior to respirators in relation to rates of laboratory confirmed influenza. So it's kind of a weak statement. You know, respirators were associated with um, having the risk of infection outcomes. So, you know, lots of different uh, uh, outcomes. Um, here were um, a summary of animal studies. Um, so this is basically to not necessarily look at prevention, but look at specific roots of infection. And you can do it um, uh, here quite well because the model systems are well established and influence its ferrets. Um, so they, they, they've tried to look uh, to see if it was aerosol versus particles versus contact. And uh, you know, basically, depending on the experiment, all of these routes uh, uh, play a role. Um, and then you had modeling investigations, which also summarize uh, you know, how things were done. You know, the one that uh, it was cited you know, frequently is you know, this study, uh, the risk assessment of aerosol transmission aboard an airplane. Uh, and in this study, the authors find that proximity and duration of exposure to the source and passenger density are an important factor. Up to 17 infections could be caused during a 17-hour flight. Uh, it's kind of, you know, uh, a 17-hour flight is a bit of a stretch. They exist, but there's about four of them, uh, uh, four routes in the world uh, that are over 16 hours. So there's, you know, one from New York to uh, Australia, I think, is that. But anyway, this was, um, uh, you know, the, 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 this got picked up by the news when it was published. So, um, Again, uh, the moral of this study is when you um, look at, uh, 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 you know, when you, when you make your decisions about how to respond to a particular pathogen, uh, you have uh, more information than what is immediately known about that pathogen. Uh, because, you know, we, we have um, previous, uh, uh, you know, w w we can rely on existing research into similar pathogens. And in fact, if you actually look back, you know, take masks as an example, there was a lot of initial confusion, you know, about what to do with masks. And if you look at sort of the time, if you, if you take uh, sort of decision maker, uh, decision making individuals, uh, you know, for example, Anthony Fauci or, uh, you know, the CDC uh, or people that were sort of the uh, communicators, uh, initially there was a lot of conflicting recommendations. Uh, uh, you know, where, you know, don't, don't wear masks because, you know, we need uh, uh, to save them for healthcare workers or, you know, don't wear masks because they might not, uh, you know, work as, as you think. Uh, and, and then it's sort of the understanding, uh, uh, understanding evolves public recommendation, uh, public policy recommendations change. Uh, so this is perfectly normal and this is something that you should consider 
when you're, uh, uh, you know, devise uh, your own potential intervention. Uh, as um, this is all, uh, let me just pause recording. <laughs>